Hello and welcome to this very first press briefing on the People's Tribunal on the murder of journalists. Um, the tribunal takes place across a six-month timeline and it consists of five hearings. The opening hearing will be convened tomorrow on the UN-designated International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. The tribunal was established as part of the A Safer World for the Truth initiative, an initiative that pursues justice for murdered journalists through documentation and investigation. Uh, it was founded by a coalition of press freedom organizations. This includes Free Press Unlimited, Reporters Without Borders, and the Commit Committee to Protect Journalists. In this briefing, you will hear from the director of each organization. Uh, and my name is Maya Muller. I will be the moderator for the Q&A session with my colleague Saskia Bass. Just before we begin, we will have a few housekeeping items to run through. Uh, so this briefing is one hour. It's a hybrid event, so it's taking place via Zoom and in person. Um, because there's quite a lot of journalists joining in online, uh, please just be patient. We will try and get a lot of as many questions answered. Um, so for those joining in on Zoom, please make sure you select the right uh, language channel. We have Spanish interpretation and English interpretation. Uh, and for sound and quality purposes, uh, please make sure uh, you use your earphones if you can. And we do. Uh, we would love it if you could tweet live about us using the hashtags and impunity and the People's Tribunal if you would like. Uh, on your screen, you will see a Q&A box. So we encourage you that whilst you're listening to the speakers that you start entering your questions. Um, and yes, please also mention your full name and media outlet. And please also specify which speaker you are directing your question to. Um, for those in the room, we will give you preference first, so if you would like to ask questions, please raise your hand. Also mention your full name and your media outlet, and uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, let me just very quickly run through the program, and then I will hand over to our wonderful speakers tonight. Uh, so the directors of the founding organizations that started A Safe World for the Truth will give a few short statements. Um, this will include Leon Willems, the Director of Policy and Programs from Free Press Unlimited and the founding father of A Safer World for the Truth. Then we will have Christophe Deloire from Reporters Sans Frontières, also known as Reporters Without Borders. Um, and then we will hand over to Joel Simon, who will join us online with a video statement. After that, we will have a few words from the lead prosecutor of the tribunal, Almudena Bernabeu. Um, she is also the co-founder and director of Guernica 37 Justice Chambers. Then uh, we will hear a little bit from uh, Hatice Cengiz. Uh, Hatice is an academic and researcher, and tomorrow she is um, testifying as a witness in the opening hearing um, as the widow of murder journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Then uh, we will hear a few words from Raisa Carrillo. Raisa is the legal director of Fundación de la Libertad de Prensa, um, who will be an expert witness in tomorrow's opening hearing. And lastly, we will have Gypsy joining us during the Q&A session as the head of advocacy and communications at the Committee to Protect Journalists. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to hand over to Leon Willems. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, honest guests, also online. Uh, very warm welcome. 1,400 journalists have been murdered since 1992. That was the year that I entered public broadcasting in the Netherlands. And of those cases, at least 900 were targeted victims um, of this death, uh, these murders, were happening because of the writing that they were doing, because of the um, malpractices that they were describing. Um, in the world that we live in, uh, murder is a problematic issue for all judicial authorities. Nevertheless, 53% of all murders globally are being led to prosecution of, uh, the, vic of the uh, perpetrators. In the case of journalists, this is only 19%. And that tells you something is wrong. Um, as an organization, Free Press Unlimited cares about the safety and protection of journalists, just as much as our colleagues here around the table, basically because we believe that if journalism isn't free, there's no independent information uh, for the public. Um, that is why we were thinking, besides protection, 
besides prevention, training, awareness of journalists, where is the prosecution? Where is the prosecution for all these murdered journalists? This inspired us to think about a innovation. We see, in fact, in many of the cases, many of the murdered journalists, that the judicial system is failing. Uh, either uh, its investigations weren't carried out properly, there's lack of political will, many wrongs. But in the international judicial system, there's no repair for it. This is one of the inspirations for a safer world for the truth. Um, one of the things we try to demonstrate is that it's possible to investigate. It's possible to find new evidence. It's possible to do something about it. But we see, unfortunately, that states are not responding to their responsibilities in this regard. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leon. I'll now hand over to Christophe. Thank you so much, uh, dear all. I'm so proud to sit at the same table, uh, that is the table of the founding father of uh, a safer world for the truth. Today, the world capital of justice is also the world capital of press freedom. This is a very powerful message to be in the ache on the occasion of November 2nd, the day which has been uh, considered by the UN to be the day to fight impunity for crimes against journalists. <laughs> and there is clearly no better place in the world to address the impunity of crimes against journalists today. A few days ago, the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to two journalists. There is today this new initiative. This is not only by chance. This is because clearly we entered into a decisive decade for journalism. And we need to really fight back. We really need to find new ways to defend journalism and to fight against to those who violate the right of journalists, including the right to life. We clearly need a new push. We have and we do, um, we have to and we do uh, renew our toolboxes. We have to implement new methods and this initiative is clearly very innovative and, and powerful and strong. Our objective, The objective of this People's Tribunal, in our eyes, is clearly that there is no need for People's Tribunals anymore regarding journalists. But unfortunately, there is a huge need. Let's make no mistake, what we want is clearly real justice in real life. I would like to commend our colleagues, starting, of course, with FPU, with uh, Leon, Ruth, Saskia, Yasmin, and your team for putting together this joint project. And really, congratulations and, and, and thank you. Together, we will uh, be uh, shedding light on the plea of impunity. I would like to also uh, thank the CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, for uh, the good cooperation. We will welcome the words of Joel Simon. Uh, an occasion to pay a tribute to him and uh, to work with uh, Gypsy. And really, we are very proud at Reporters Without Borders RSF to be part of this initiative. And I would like to say hello and thank uh, all the other participants, whatever the status. <coughs> it is really a crucial moment uh, for the right to information. Because of this information, all powers have the capacity to reach directly their audiences. So all the intermediaries are fragilized, are weakened. And uh, we clearly have uh, to defend those intermediaries, which are journalists, uh, because uh, thanks to their rights and duties, uh, they can clearly bring a huge contribution to the right to information, to the right to reliable information. So thank you. 
Thank you, Christophe. We'll now um, quickly swift over to the video by Joel Simon, the Executive Director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. Hello, I'm Joel Simon, the Executive Director of the Committee to Protect Journalists. I'm pleased to join you today for the launch of the People's Tribunal in the Murder of Journalists. The Tribunal opens a groundbreaking path by showing how we can deliver justice. Governments must follow suit. The battle against impunity began as a regional initiative in Latin America more than 20 years ago. That's when our colleagues at the Inter-American Press Association began a systematic effort to track and investigate the killings of journalists in the region. That effort expanded in 2006 when CPJ and other press freedom groups launched the global campaign against impunity. We focused initially on two of the most murderous countries for journalists, Russia and the Philippines. Last month, the Nobel Committee recognized the struggle against violence and repression in both countries by awarding the Nobel Peace Prize to two courageous journalists and our good friends, Dmitry Muratov and Maria Ressa. In the fight against impunity, there has been slow progress and some hard-earned justice. CPJ's latest impunity index released last week shows that in 226 or 81% of the murders of journalists over the last 10 years, the killers walk free. As terrible as that number is, it has dropped from 87% when the impunity index was launched nearly 15 years ago. Only by delivering justice can we convince the masterminds and perpetrators that censorship by murder is no longer possible. This People's Tribunal holds that promise. We must now hold governments to account. Millions of people rely on news daily and ultimately, as we saw in the 65,000 people that hit the streets when investigative journalist Jan Kuczak was murdered in Slovakia just three years ago, the people will not stand for censorship. Thank you, Joel. <laughs> um, I'd just like to say before handing over to Alma Dana that those joining in online, if you could start entering your questions in the Q&A box, that would be great. Uh, so yes, Alma Dana, the lead prosecutor of the tribunal. This is on, yes. Hello, oh, yes, it is on. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you. I just want to say um, thank you very much. I'm impressed, I am a little bit overwhelmed, and I am hope I can do a good job tomorrow about not only the organization and, and the, I think the strong effort and the result that we're gonna see, we hope to see in the next day and through the next few months, but also on the initiative and what it's trying to achieve. I, you know, then I have to reveal how old I am, but I've been for a while trying to fight impunity and it is, you know, I will never say that the work um, becomes tedious or or boring. Unfortunately, we humans continue inventing wars and ways of attacking each other and violating international norms. But I have to confess uh, how ignorant I was about the situation of freedom of expression and journalists in particular. And it resembles, I was just mentioning privately to a good old friend, um, it, it resembles a lot of the things that we were not doing, not because we, we were not thinking of it or because we were particularly stupid 25 years ago, but because we couldn't address, the, we didn't address the problem on human rights violations of one kind or another as a, as a collective, premeditated, deliberate effort targeting groups of people or communities or countries for that matter. And I think that uh, that is what is to me very intriguing, fascinating, and I would like to commend everybody putting this effort together that through just the sessions of working with the witnesses and getting familiar with what we're going to hopefully see <clears throat> in more detail tomorrow, I realize the depth of the problem, the patterns, the coincidences, and what uh, was happening in Slovakia resembles dramatically what's happening in the Philippines or Colombia for the matter. And I think that when we, and I include myself because you invited me here, that I may never leave uh, when it comes to to investigating or to trying to, to push fight against impunity for the murder of journalists. I think that when we come together uh, and we understand 
this as a, as a global problem and that requires perhaps more minutia, um, you know, different aspects of evidence gathering efforts the CPJ and other organizations are doing. But from, from a lawyer perspective, what we can contribute is to look at this differently as we're saying. I think we have been looking at it. Uh, and, and when you cannot trust the states, you have to go to judicial actors. I couldn't agree more with the very first statement and hope for the autonomy and independence. But coming to them with the, with the perhaps I want to say, you know, the rigorous and the, the, the small, the work of investigating and really presenting it to the world. And in that task, in my opinion, but I'm very new, I still um, to be done further, perhaps, and deeper, this effort, this People's Tribunal, is to me essential. And it is not the beginning of the struggles. You have been doing this for a number of years. and, and exposing these, these crimes, but I think these efforts become the beginning of a sh uh, an important shift in the way these, and I will say, maybe for, because it's obvious, it shouldn't be less important. 25, 35 years ago, we were having symbolic tribunals to talk about gender violence. Today, it's unthinkable to look or to face any investigation into uh, human rights violations, international crimes of the kind that journalists are suffering, or repression of rights such as freedom of expression without that angle. So I do believe we are just so slow with humans, but we, there is a, a natural evolution, and I think that this, um, this effort is, is extraordinary, and I just want to say thank you for um, counting me as part of it. Thank you, Amadena. We will now pass on to Hatich Cengiz. Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I am. Uh, I, my name is Hatice Jengiz. Um, I am uh, academic and researcher, but I am attending this event as a widow of journalist Jamal Kashikchi, uh, who murdered in Istanbul, second of October, two thousand eighteen. Uh, I am attending this uh, People's Tribunal uh, on the murder of journalists uh, because uh, to remind the, the world again what happened to Jamal and why we couldn't achieve any justice until now and how people, uh, in, in the past people was targeting journalists but now the government and the leaders of governments targeting journalists. So it's a very, very important point. And, and I just noticed that uh, the Christophe and Leon um, invited to me many times in their countries to give my um, testimony to understand me directly. But now I am at the same stage with them. Still, I was, I was talking about Jamal now I'm talking about the journalists. So still the same um, problem we are in. And the, the, the circle, they're getting extend every, every day, every year. So uh, I, I remember one time, he, uh, Christophe, took me to, uh, in, in France, I think, right? The bio. Anyway, it was a very uh, interesting, I, I want to share with you. Uh, it's a garden, uh, they put the names of journalists who killed um, during year. Every year there is a very big stone, and uh, on the stone, the written of uh, names of the killed journalists. So when I uh, went to 2018, I saw Jamal's name, one of the stones that they put there. For me, it was a very, very sad uh, situation because uh, I was thinking Jamal is in a very different story. It's not just about the write his name on the stone. Yes, I know at the end of the day he's a journalist. But what I want to say that it's um, he become at the end of the day one of the journalists. They killed, they killed him like the another people. Maybe the different for me, it, it, he was my, my husband or, or my, my love or everything, but 
look at the big picture. We are very, very big danger. So, thank you. Thank you, Aditya. Um, and now pass on to Raisa Carrillo from FLIP. Okay, thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Raisa Carrillo. I'm here on, be on behalf of the Free Prayers Foundation in Colombia. I where I'm the legal coordinator and also the coordinator for the protection team. And I want to thank you all for the organization of this event. For us, it's very important that these kind of topics uh, can be on the spotlight, particularly because in Colombia and in a region, impunity is even at the higher rates, as you said. Uh, we have even 98% of the cases of threats that are in impunity and 76% that are on murder cases. Um, this event for us is very, very relevant because it comes at the timely manner for, to endorse um, a decision from the Inter-American Court where even impunity was recognized as a form of, of torture. So in the case of Jeanette Bedoya, where Flip represented uh, together with Sahil, um, this case, for the, it's one of the main challenges that we face every day in our work. Um, impunity, the structural uh, challenges that Almedeo was telling you about, um, both from the investigation, but also from the prevention side. And I think we, we all share this concern that uh, fighting and advocating for free press is kind of a matter of principle um, in these days because of the complexity of the political context. Thank you very much. Okay, we will now open the floor to Q&A. Um, we'll give first uh, the chance for journalists in the room to ask questions. Does anybody have a question so far in the room? David. Hi, a general question, especially for Almudena, and a question for Raisa, for Almudena and all of you. Uh, given that this is a, like a symbolic tribunal, do you think that this could lead in the future, the evidence that you said, for the, that you present, for example, to to case in in national tribunals or even international tribunals? So, do you think that this could help with this? And Raisa, if you could develop a bit more about the situation with journalists in the region in South America, or Colombia, or Mexico, if you can explain a bit about that. That's it. Okay, I'll just be brief because then, then I have, everybody has a chance because I can talk. No, but I, I do believe so. And, and it's not just, you know, because I'm the eternal optimistic when you get to know me, but it is because we've seen it before. The some, some issues when you look at uh, the last 50 years, perhaps, of the conquest in human rights accountability and the struggle, the fight against impunity, you've seen many times, and I use the gender violence as an example, but there are plenty where the first step was, for the most part, impunity, which I think we've seen here, and it will be discussed through our witnesses' contributions tomorrow, has many faces, but you start seeing the one impunity there is. Um, as I said before, deliberate and ignorance and kind of ruling it out and minimizing the problem. It is more, it's always when you start thinking, you know, they start thinking, but this is a one case in Mexico, isolated from the Colombian case, and then the one from the Philippines, nothing to, nothing to do with the one in the United States. When they start doing that, it's where they kind of, what I call the web of impunity starts setting that, and then it's very difficult to get any justice at all. And I think that these allows for allow me, this is my word, collective, making it a collective issue, a co an issue that has uh, common strains, whatever you are and whatever is happening. And these symbolic tribunals, you know, we sometimes put a lot of faith in criminal <laughs> law, which as much as I do believe it's, um, it's, it has to be used and it's effective and it's, uh, justice should be granted by a court and by, you know, all the, the proper and, and form formalities. I think they shouldn't underestimate the importance of the outreach and, and awareness that this kind of efforts provide. And it's, in my opinion, it's a, it's a, st a step, never, it's not number one, this hu this colleagues and professionals have been doing this for a long time, but it could be many times be traced as a step one in the, in the, in this, you know, in the struggle for against impunity. 
Maybe, maybe just also on the, the nature of uh, what we're trying to achieve here in the wider context of the Safer World for the Truth program. The, the cases that will be presented uh, tomorrow are uh, indications of the systemic nature of the judicial neglect of journalist murder. Um, the three cases that will then be followed up in January, February, and March are cases where the state responsibility is denied by the authorities nationally, and actually national legislation process has been uh, impossible. There's been no possibility for progress. However, uh, one of the aspects of the project that we're uh, with our partners, uh, RSF and CPJ, are, are conducting as Free Press Unlimited is investigations into cold cases of journalist murder in countries like Pakistan uh, and uh, uh, other parts of the world. And for example, in the case of uh, a case that we investigated in Pakistan, we found new evidence. We found that the investigation wasn't carried out properly. Uh, we found that eyewitnesses that had testimonies uh, were not uh, documented and were neglected by the police, uh, basically because the same police, um, um, that same police uh, force was um, the object of the writing of Subari Mujahid. He was documenting corruption of the police force. This same police force was then asked to investigate him. Now, one of the things that we managed to achieve is that the lawyers that worked with us in Pakistan and the family asked the, the courts there to reopen uh, the case. In other words, what we're trying to achieve is justice for all these murder journalists, to give them their day in court, to find and show that it's possible to investigate these cases, whereas all of the times when uh, whether it's uh, the Committee to Protect Journalists or Reporters Sans Frontières or Free Press Unlimited or local organizations appeal to the states, appeal to the United Nations, people are saying, no, this is impossible and this is an unclear case and we cannot investigate it and there's uh, controversial circumstances. No, this was a crossfire. So many excuses for not doing justice and investigate properly what was going on. And I think that, that that is what I really feel very passionate about. We can do something about this. We can investigate these cases. We can reopen. We can open new roads for justice. But the fact is that there's a lack of interest. There's a lack of priority. In some countries, a um, very notorious case in my own country, four broadcasters were killed in 1982. This rests now with a very tiny judge in a very small village in El Salvador to investigate. There's lack of capacity. There's lack of resources. These things can be solved. That is what, what we, from, from my perspective as a press freedom activist, I want to ask attention for. We can change this. Thank you very much, Leon. Uh, anyone else in the room? Yes. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Jan Hinop. I work for Agence France Press. Um, I'd just like to commend the work that you're doing. Uh, I think it's very worthwhile. Um, and I would just like to make an observation more than a question I'd like to ask. Um, and that's a, a, an appeal for one of my friends who were killed in Libya in 2011. His name is Anton Hamerl. He's a photographer. You might have heard of his case. Um, and I'd just like to know, would his case, for instance, be of interest to you because his family has been trying for the last 10 years to get justice? It's very hard to get justice in a place like Libya for somebody like that, but would you be interested and are you looking, for instance, at his case? I will just give a quick answer that we've been working on his case, as you may know, uh, along with James Foley, who was focused on his case because, if I'm not wrong, Anton was uh, one of his friends. And, and of course, um, the case of Anton is one of the cases that has to be investigated, continue to be investigated in the future uh, with this project or uh, outside. And, and uh, in any case, uh, the work we are doing on other cases uh, beyond this project through our strategic litigation 
activities uh, has to be continued and amplified, and I would like to mention the presence of Antoine Bernard, who is the head of strategic, strategic litigation at RSF. I actually just wanted to add to that, that um, w for those who are not familiar with Anton's case, I mean, I, I think part of the tragedy of Anton Hamel's case, um, and I remember when this happened, was, was that there was nobody ever found, no, nobody ever returned to the family. And um, missing journalists are, are also um, something that our organizations work on. Um, and the Committee to Protect Journalists has documented 66 journalists missing. Um, so these may very well be journalists who have been murdered. Um, and we continue to look into their cases together with allied groups. So there is certainly a quest for answers in those cases. Any more questions from the room? Okay, I do have a question uh, coming in. Uh, this is from John Alsop, for writing for the Columbia Journalism Review. He has a question, how important do, uh, do members of the panel think the recent Nobel Awards for Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov were in the fight against impunity for crimes against journalists? Uh, they clearly raised broader awareness of crimes against journalists, but how do you translate that into concrete accountability? Uh, maybe we could bring that to Gypsy and then have a few words from Almudena and perhaps others if they would like to follow up. Sure. I mean, I think I want to echo what Christophe said earlier, that it is not a coincidence um, that the Nobel Peace Prize went this year to two journalists in countries where impunity has been a constant problem over decades. And what it means is really bringing to the public consciousness, and this speaks to what Almudena was saying earlier about an understanding that this is an endemic problem, that it affects us all. And that can translate into a response, a response from the legal system. What we're doing and what Leon so eloquently described earlier is wielding journalism in the legal system, so to speak, because these are journalistic investigations looking into cases that had either inexistent or flawed probes by local authorities. And we do believe that there is no way that the world has been made aware of the stories of Maria Ressa and Dmitry Muratov and the deaths involved in the Philippines where the Maguindanao massacre led to the largest incident of assassination of journalists that we've ever recorded. Um, or, or Russia where we've seen obviously um, Dmitry's newsroom Novaya Gazeta with multiple deaths um, including the emblematic Anna Politovskaya case, there's no way that the world hears of this and that courtrooms will remain deaf. There's very little to add, but just to uh, perhaps one, one thing that is also often um, not seen is that the, the, despite of all the legal work and all the investigation work, there's it is something fundamental in, in the fight against impunity, which is the resilience of the families of the victims and the endurance of these long processes. I mean, that kind of uh, never-ending, extraordinary energy. And I think that I'm not always, I mean, I'm not all the time agreeing with the decisions on the on the novel laureates, sometimes you know you wonder, but I think that there is a clear message. It is no coincidence. I think is, and I actually think he's brave, and it puts um, sheds a light on the issue that very few things can do, and the Peace Prize can. And I've, I'm just I'm just feeling that they deserve an applause for what is worth uh, in that regard. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, maybe, maybe just to add an, a comment on Maria Ressa and the case of uh, Novaya Gazeta, who has, as Gypsy is rightly saying, multiple deaths over the past 20 years. I think one of the important things that we have to remember when we talk about killing journalists, when we kill a journalist, when we let that happen, we kill stories. We kill stories that are important, that uncover wrongdoing. Anna Politkovskaya was 
um, uh, documenting human rights abuses in Chechnya during the uh, Chechenian war, um, Maria Ressa is uncovering the murderous uh, policy of uh, President Duterte's uh, regime. So when we threaten journalists, we threaten the public right to know about these stories that these people are working on. Just imagine, since 92, 1,400 journalists. It's 1,400 families that have a hole in their soul. It's 1,400 sets of colleagues that have, deprived of just, have been deprived of justice. It means that a lot of people in some of these vulnerable countries have been silenced because they fear the same faith. So there's self-censorship. And then there's the stories which are withheld from the public. So all in all, this is the problematic aspect of it. It's, it's not just the isolated case of, of, of a death. It's much more than that. It's censorship. It's killing stories that we need to know because those that rule us or those that try to uh, influence criminally our societies are trying to kill the stories also. Thank you. Yes, uh, we have another question from Ghana, uh, Mark Sando, um, owner of Community Watchdogs. His question is, how can journalists get in touch, uh, especially journalists in Africa, um, with a safe world for the truth? So maybe to clarify uh, which cases we are choosing, uh, perhaps, Leon, you could answer that. Um, well, as I said, I mean, the, um, the, the project is a pilot project, and we certainly hope that we can continue with this effort. Uh, so we managed to investigate uh, these three cases that we're bringing to the uh, People's Tribunal, plus 10 other cases. We hope to continue with that effort. We cannot do everything. One of the things we find, actually, is that a lot of information is available in these local countries. Um, people know about these cases. They are emblematic, also at their own level. People in Colombia know about the impact of the journalists that were killed in Colombia. Uh, people in Africa are still talking about the death of, um, uh, uh, in, in Burkina Faso, of an investigative reporter. So these are cases where we actually, and I think that that is one of the appeals to the states uh, that, that govern us, is there are these local organizations who need to be resourced better to do this job with us. It's not about us, you know, a team of five excellent researchers. Uh, some of them are here, and I, 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 I've been very fortunate to be working with them because they've done a stellar job. But uh, this should be the, the work of hundreds of people because we need to solve all these cases. So as much as I would encourage um, the, the one who's asking this question from Ghana to contact us. Um, let's also see what we can do to assist you in doing what is needed in Ghana. Thank you, Leon. A uh, question for Almudena. Uh, I guess this is more of a technical question, um, which I'm going to say the question is, how do you collect evidence? I think that's what's being asked. And this is by Lao Wikramatunga, um, who is a relative of um, the Wikramatunga family, uh, the first hearing happening in January. And it's, a, it's a big question, because um, each case, the um, it would require, you know, different, and I think there are colleagues that know the, the, the patterns of the, the killings and they are on top of how to investigate. I will tell you something that we've not been doing very well, and that's across, um, that's across the spectrum, not only on the murder of journalists. I think that that's also uh, more extensive uh, in human rights, which is data protection and, and you know I think that the societies and this is something that is going to come up tomorrow through social media and everything else that you guys know everything and a lot more than, than me has make very complex to protect to, to gather but to, to protect evidence the world is going really fast when it comes to producing 
uh, information in that spectrum of things, and this is very much my opinion. And then judges, prosecutors, and lawyers are going as slow as in the Middle Ages in analyzing it, making it, uh, you know, to meet the standards, bring it to the core. So you have two different universes. One that is at a, you know, light speed, and the other one that keeps going like a eel horse. And at some point, to be effective, we have to bring those together. So how do you investigate? I think that there is being, and I think Raisa has more information and definitely all the colleagues here, the use of um, databases, the way, the ability to systematically process, gather, process, and preserve the information that we have, as insignificant as it can be. It's, it's something that we, you know, that we are improving and that we are better because of the, and I'm no expert, I may become one, but when it comes to the killing of journalists in particular, the nature of the, the crimes is even more, um, what I wanna say, it brings even more interesting when if you talk about subjective elements, so mens rea, I don't wanna be over technical to hide it, to deny it, because it is, it is in the, in the commission of the crime itself to try to hide it, more even than in the traditional state-inflicted violence. Here you have a, a desire to shut something down, to pretend they never existed or to reverse that story that came out somehow. And then in that, in all of that, um, there is a desire to also to perverse or to destroy the evidence. So I think that there are some cues that we all should develop and learn about what is to investigate and what is to protect this evidence to be effective. But again, I'm speaking about something that is just intuitively, I know my colleagues have been doing, I think software databases have been grown with more specific um, detail and, and, and I think that we are lacking a little bit of that. And it's just, it's just a matter of sitting down with it and understanding the, the, the needs of the investigation. But I think that the, that is a challenge that I can tell and that I think will be overcome. But it's just data handling, I will say. Got it. I'm Thank not sure if I answer very well that answer that question, but it is complicated. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any further questions in the room? Yes, Jan. Thank you. My my question is for Atiche. Um, I hope I pronounced that right. Um, in the last three years, um, we've been talking about how. Um, events like this impacts one's life um, after uh, a murder of a journalist. But can you tell me a little bit about what has happened in the, in the, in the last years after, um, after the murder, how your life has changed, and um, how, how does one deal with some, something like this? Ağırdı mı yapalım yoksa? Siz söyleyin ben küçüğüm. Tamam. Yani aslında şey söylemek istiyorum. Yani aslında işin iki yönü var. Birincisi duygusal yönü var. Beni ilgilendiren şahsi yönü yani. It has two sides. One is emotional and the other is yes. Diğeri de dünyayı ilgilendiren ve hukuki boyutta bütün... Cemal, Cemal gibi insanları ilgilendiren bir boyutu var. And the other is the judicial question for the world. Ben kendimle ilgili olan duygusal kısmını yani kadın olarak hissetmiş olduğum şeyleri çok uzun süre sonra aşabildim. Yani hala daha aşabildiğimi söyleyemeyeceğim. Yani o duygusal yalnızlığım, duygusal anlamda kalbimin kırıklığı vesaire bu meseleyle alakalı olarak hissetmiş olduğum ve hayatıma değişmiş olan şeyler hala devam ediyor. What I have experienced personally as a, a wife, as a, a from a murdered husband, is something really difficult, and I still feel this every day. Diğer yandan, yani ben ister istemez kendimi seçim yapmadan bir savaşın içinde buldum. O yüzden, yani. And at the same time, I was in the middle of a huge fight worldwide, without choosing for this. E, o yüzden çok fazla seçim şansım yoktu. E, yani bu, bunu yapmam lazımdı. Yani yapmamak gibi bir şansım yoktu. Sonuçta haksız yere öldürülmüş bir insanın hakkını savunmak bence her insanın görevi. Since I had no uh, yeah 
choosing in this, I had to fight from the beginning because there is uh, someone who was murdered and I have to fight for my rights. Thank you very much. Any other questions? No. Okay. Ah, yes, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Uh, Raisa, you are uh, participating tomorrow as a witness. Mm -hmm. Could you, I know that this is tomorrow, but could you highlight a bit what you are talking about or what are you going to talk? Um, sure. Um, part of the testimony is very related to what we have said before, that um, impunity also lies on a lot of structural problems. Uh, we have named some of them um, previously. There is a lack of resources, lack of preparation from the investigators, particularly in Latin America, regarding the international standards. Uh, but you also have many other underlying problems, social, political problems. You also have the corruption and the judicial system, which is one of the main pro problems in this. Like, why, why is impunity rate so high? That's what we should be asking ourselves as well, because it's not coincidence. Um, we have said the press also point always point out like the the critical points where the shadows on the political debate is, and many of this is part of the of the lack of transparency during the investigations. We ha also have named all the uh, lack of diligence, and it's still part of the same. It's still part of the structure and this willingness to to erase evidence and to erase what the journalists were investigating. So it's all part of the plan. I think that's kind of the, the main point. And this is something that we, we share uh, worldwide. And I think that's one of the main uh, concerns that we have. Any more questions? Perhaps um, some of the speakers, anyone would like to add? Okay, <coughs> I guess we can wrap up then. Uh, let's just give perhaps people online um, one last chance. There's still quite a lot of people present. Uh, if you're joining in online, please enter your questions now, otherwise we will wrap up shortly. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you all very much for joining, uh, and I hope you will closely follow all the hearings which will take place until May 2022. Thank you. Maya?